Well, hello there from the number eight TV and film podcast in Singapore. And welcome to uh, Elwood City Limits, the episodic Arthur podcast. Uh, it's Will here. And yes, I know. When it's just me, when it doesn't start with a conversation between Lucas and I, that can only mean, oh, Lucas isn't there this time. Well, yes, that is true. Lucas isn't here this time, but let me, uh, let me, let me, let me, po- let me pose you a, a, an alternate situation here. What if we had ourselves, not just a guest, but a guest who has been here a couple of times. This is actually appearance number three for this person, but this is the first time that they are here to talk to me about an episode of Arthur which happens to be the show that they worked on once upon a time. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen and everybody in between, please welcome back to Elwood City Limits, the the great, the wonderful, the beloved in the Arthur community, Jason Schwimmer. Hey, Jason. Beloved? Wow. Oh. I'd go so far as to say, yeah. Wow, that's, this is all very nice and overwhelming. Thank you so much for having me back. (laughs) I'm, uh... I'm excited to be here. I I don't think I hold a candle to Lucas's hosting abilities, but I will do my best. Oh, please! The ple- the pleasure is all mine, and I and I go so far as to say beloved because I think that of course, if you if you listener are not familiar with Jason Schwimmer, you should be because I feel that if you are listening to this show, Elwood City Limits, you would you should be listening to the entirety of the Finding DW podcast. Now, many of our listeners have listen to the Finding DW podcast, and they loved it, as did myself and Lucas. But if not, you're really missing the boat here. You gotta check it out. You gotta check it out. But in case you didn't know, Jason Schwimmer, a uh, former voice actor in many respects, including as DW, the voice of DW on Arthur, uh, earlier on in the show's career, and now uh, (laughs) he is trying to make it work like the rest of us. He's you're you're you 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 have you have many talents. You're a multidisciplinary in some senses. You you know you've done obviously podcast recording and editing. You have experience in acting, and you are looking for. I am am would I be right in saying that you're looking for the next opportunity? Um. Yeah. Yes and no. I mean, I appreciate you saying all the things that make me so incredibly impressive and talented. No, I'm kidding. I <laughs> I. You know what? Like the um. So, like, as as you say, thank you for for the kind words and for everyone who's listened to the podcast. Um, like, that was my podcast, Finding DW, was as I've mentioned before. I'm sure um, it's an idea I had for a long time, and it was so fun to finally get to make it. And I'm I'm really happy with how it came out um, and how it all came together. Um, I think that you know, much like my career as a voice actor. You know, it it sort of book and I, I mean, it sort of came and went, and I'm very happy with that. Mm-hmm. And so, the po- with with my podcast, Finding DW, I knew going in that I didn't want it to be this indefinite thing or this long term project. Um, I knew it was going to be this sort of like short spurt. Um, I wanted it to ha- be the, just this arc, this narrative, me going on this journey, and it's done. And and so now it's just been a, a question of. You know, much like yourself and and Lucas, you know, we we're not making these podcasts as our full time job. So the question has just become, well, how can I build my you know a business or an infrastructure around myself such that I can mm-hmm. work on the next idea that I have that's like finding DW? Because as you know, as you know, I'm sure uh, balancing real life with creative pursuits is not always the easiest thing in the world to do. So for me, it's just been a question of how can I, how can I build a business that enables me to make enough money to earn a comfortable living while I keep trying projects like Finding DW? Because I don't want to stop pursuing nonfiction narrative projects. Does that mm-hmm. make sense? I think so, okay. and I would encourage I would encourage you to do so because, I mean, listen, I I didn't just I didn't just come on the show to to kiss up to you, but while we're here, mwah, 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 back at you, buddy. <laughs> I but I but I'm serious, like, and I've and I've said this as soon as it started. I was very taken with the Finding DW podcast, oh. and as somebody who not who you know makes a podcast, but I've also been listening to them for over a decade now. It's 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 very well put together. It's one of the it's one of the good ones. Your audio quality is always really crisp. The interviews and the the lines of questioning you went down and the interview subjects that you had are really really great for uh, 
uh, an Arthur fan, but it also appeals like across across the, uh, the spectrum. But yeah, totally. I think that I just wanted to impress upon our listeners that if you haven't gotten around to it that yet, now is the time to get around to it. But you know, you and I, we we uh, you know. Lucas and I, we interviewed you for the podcast. Then you and I had a Patreon follow-up that, uh, yes, if you're a patron, you can check that out right now. It's We talked for over 40 minutes and then some <laughs> on uh, on patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. So if you haven't gotten around to it, please make sure that you do. And by say all that to mean that we've already done the interview thing. Now, now you're in, now you're in 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 our turn. You're on <laughs> you're in Elwood City Limits country. You're on the limits of Elwood City Limits, and it's time for to welcome you into uh well talking about Arthur. Yeah, something that I'm very excited to do in your in your format because you know my podcast might be about Arthur or about the show Arthur, but yours in in my view is the Arthur podcast. So I'm just excited to help support however I can. And we're excited to have you here. Now, of course, I want to take this opportunity as well to uh, to pump ourselves up a little bit here. And we want to say thanks, Lucas and I and every – well, I was going to say everybody at Elwood City Limits, but it's Lucas and I. So we want to say <laughs> thank you for 1,000 followers and 1,000 followers plus Woo! on Instagram. Yeah. Thank you all very much for following us. That's awesome. Finally, people clued in that you guys are worth fo- a follow. Congratulations. And, and That's very exciting. I'm always – Thank you very much. I'm always a little like self uh, uh, self conscious about it because, of course, I don't follow the like pristine meme format that gets like tens of thousands of shares, you know, and has people stealing from you and all that kind of stuff. You know, like we we get we get quite a lot of traffic. It's one of our it's you know it's one of our bigger social media accounts, and we're very grateful. It's just you know, it's one of those opportunities with like. Ugh. I could be doing so much more, (laughs) but I think we're still doing really, really well for where we are. And as always, it's thanks to everybody who listens to us. So we're very grateful. And uh, yeah, you just happen to join us when we have this uh, uh, very, um, very uh, uh, snooty uh, uh, hallmark that we just hit. So, uh, you know, you, you came to you came to the right place. We're 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 big shots, too, in this podcasting world i i absolutely i i don't think you need to i'm sold i was sold already that you're you're the big shots absolutely i am uh as i've said before you know i've got i've got a little bit of a cheat code in the arthur podcast game so the fact that you guys are doing what you're doing and that you hit a thousand followers is amazing i mean here's to many more thank you very much now we're going to get to the episode of course in just a little bit here and we usually this is around the time where we answer emails at elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com which is where you can send in all of your correspondence to us we only have one email this time around so i'm just going to give it a quick read here from my phone um so this one is titled new canadian fans and this is it's one email but it has two senders uh, the first sender goes by the nickname Yopi Yogurt, who says, Hey, Elwood City Limits. I love the podcast. It's been close to two months since my mom and I have been listening to your podcast. I'm actually starting one in school for a project. I got voted to be one of the hosts with one of my friends. Well, I was go- I was gone in Nova Scotia to see my grandma, who was moving from Hal- to Halifax from Digby. I come from New Brunswick, and I believe that Will is from there as well. I'm excited because you are probably hovering near season 20 or further. Uh, well, actually, Nova, we are actually also from Nova Scotia. New Brunswick is the province over, but close, very, very close. And now the second sender in the same email is from Liz, who is Yopi's mom. My name is Liz, and I googled podcasts for Arthur since my son and I love the show. I found your podcast, and my son and I enjoy listening to it in the evenings. I wasn't thinking I would listen to your podcast, but I listened to it with my son, and it's a nice way to spend time together winding down from our day. So that's from Liz and Yopi. And see, that's, I mean, that is just a microcosm of why this is still so fulfilling after six years. (laughs) Liz and Yopi. Oh, my goodness. This is so... Nice. I'm so, so happy that they have your podcast to wind down with at the end of their hard days. And spe- and so speaking of names, so that'll do it for ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. Uh, feel free to send in your feedback. Now's the time when we usually talk about Patreon because we've got some stuff happening at Patreon.com slash ElwoodCityLimits. Our most recent episode of For the Kids, a PBS Kids podcast, We it, it got pretty real up in there. As we talked about... 
not to spoil it, but one of the better PBS kids shows that I think we've covered on the entire in the entire 41 episodes. We talked about Molly of Denali, Ooh. which has its roots in Arthur. Yeah. Uh, one of the uh, one of the creators of the show is actually someone that you interviewed on your show, Jason, Kathy Wall. That's right. Yeah. And it's a really terrific show for uh, specifically uh, made with indigenous voices in mind. And as part of the creative team, it was really wonderful to talk about. And at times it was very, you know, we, we talked about reality a little bit in there as well. And reality, we scratched on the reality that a lot of indigenous people face today, but also did so by uh, with a little bit of hope because a show like Molly of Denali exists. So if you want to hear our full thoughts, you can subscribe to us over at Patreon. Now, I wanted to take this opportunity because every every two weeks, the patrons hear me say a bunch of na- a bunch of their names. Uh, but I thought maybe I'm going to put this in the chat right here. I was wondering, Jason, I have randomly selected a few names from the Patreon, and I wonder if you wouldn't mind uh, reading them out right here. Sure, absolutely, yeah. Um, so what? How does this part work? How do you want me to do so this without I'll, screwing up? Well, so I will I will just say thank you to all of our patrons who subscribe, and as per our uh, our promise, here are a few random names that we picked out. So here we go: Katie P, Jenny, Cardenas, Cardenas, Coyote zero six two zero, Rory Forever, Americana Dream. That's that's a pretty great username. Awesome Eddie 21. I think they follow me on Instagram. Casey Cosmos. Sydney Long. I'm going to do it like the SNL guy. Revd. <laughs> EJ Acra. Pretty Cool Stairs. Cat. John Dulong. And musical guest, Leanne S. Thank, thanks a lot, Jason. You're very welcome. And Thank you to, again to all of our patrons. Patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. We've got some fun stuff coming up there in the next few weeks. Now, I actually just put up an update on the Discord and on the Patreon uh, this week. So please check it out if you're already a patron and it just gives you an idea. Our schedule is going to be changing a little bit. Of course, uh, changes in our schedule have allowed Jason to be here tonight. And it's going to be... An interesting May. It's going to be not exactly what you expect, but I think we're going to be giving you some stuff that you're really going to like, such as Jason Schwimmer talking about this episode of of Arthur. As we traipse through season 14, we have to make a stop at falafel So this is, I mean, obviously we we are long since past when you would have been on on the show. Were you still watching Arthur? Like, what, like, were you still watching Arthur after you worked on it? And at what point do you feel like you stopped? This is where your whole audience turns on me. Um, I stopped <laughs> watching Arthur the second I got cast. Um, oh. It just totally changed my relationship with the show. I was a huge mm. fan before. That's sure. how I. That's how I. I do credit getting the part on the show to just knowing the show very well and to having Mm -hmm. sisters that are very similar or were very similar to DW. Um, So I think, I don't know. Uh, Yeah. I, I, it's, it's when I started doing my podcast, that's when I got back into it. That's when I started watching more Arthur than I ever have in my entire life episodes I was in and otherwise. Um, Mm -hmm. So it's always weird and different for me because I feel like I don't have that same, nostalgic relationship with the show that a lot of people do um i i have that with other shows so it was cool to see okay okay well let me let me follow that what would be so if you were going to do an elwood city limit style podcast about a cartoon that you have as much passion for when you were my age as i do with Arthur, right well what do you think that cartoon might be it's tough because there are so many that I would want to do. I still like yeah. kind of want to do us um like a I was really I've always been really into anime like ever since I oh. discovered it. <laughs> so okay. so yeah, yeah, yeah. you know Pokemon and stuff was my entry point, but I've always thought it would be really funny to do like a facetious Digimon is better than Pokemon Elwood City Limits style uh, <laughs> podcast like where where each like you know each episode I have thought about this. It's like each episode okay. we would I, I would force someone 
and and I would too watch an episode of Pokemon and an episode of Digimon, and I would staunchly oh. argue that the Digimon episode was better, and that's it because I loved Digimon, and I oh yes. and and I am also the contrarian person who only wants to like the thi- like the underdog thing or like music yes. that not everyone's heard of and stuff. It's like mm-hmm. I I hope it's a charming quality, but I don't think it is. <laughs> It all depends on how you play it, I guess. Yeah, um, you have to be a little bit uh, self-aware, I think, and a little bit self-deprecating. That's at least my, <laughs> without feeling bad about yourself. Like that's sort of the line I straddle with it. Yes. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, well, that I mean that um, that does sound interesting. I know that there are. I mean, at this point, even if I didn't know, there have to be Digimon and Pokemon podcasts out the wazoo. But you're not alone. I have close friends who are still into Digimon to this very day. I certainly had a very intense phase with it as well and I think that was probably on maybe not the short list but the long list of like shows that I would talk about at le- at length. But ultimately I think that there is a Digimon podcast out there right now and I'm sure they're doing quite well for themselves, but I don't know if they if they necessarily tackle the Digimon cross Pokémon uh, or or would maybe it would be like X, yeah, Digimon X Pokemon uh, versus podcast. So you might have something there. Yeah, I think that it would make sense that there'd be a Digimon uh, podcast because, like Pokemon, they're still making new stuff. Even in, at yes. the beginning of the pandemic, they were they were a couple episodes into the first season of like Digimon 2020, which doesn't have an English mm-hmm. dub yet. That I was super into it was coming out um, like weekly on Sundays or whatever, and. You know, in isolation, I would wake up on Sundays and make pancakes and watch Digimon 2020. So not bad, not bad at all. all right. You know, okay. Yeah. I don't think I would. I don't think that I would have necessarily guessed it. But I always have to remind myself that like you and I are around the same age, so yeah. it's just totally like yeah. We probably and we probably have a lot more crossover in terms of cartoons that we watch than than we th- than I think that we do. Yeah, you know, it's it's not it's not like you were like ten years older, just like oh yeah, I was way into like. Thundar or Jason the Wheeled Warriors or something. Yeah, I mean, for me, it was just I, um, it's it's shows like that. Like I was the prime age for Pokemon for sure. And mm-hmm. uh, as soon as I had access to watching shows on like on Disney Channel, I was very into the Weekenders and Recess. Yeah. So I'd love to do like a Weekenders pod, but like, dude, there's not that many episodes. But I still I reference it constantly in my life because there's so many good bits like. Couscous, the food's so nice they named it twice. Like that's just good comedy for a kid and for like it's, adults, I think. It's very, it's very sticky. You say the Weekenders, and I think Skate Abration and yeah, uh, just all of those, all of those other. Actually, there was a tweet recently. I don't. It wasn't viral or anything, but it was somebody who was just like, "Am I the only person who says uh, um, Tish's mom in the show is like?" Um, I'll just say Eastern European. Yes, yeah, inexplicably and, Eastern European. <laughs> exactly. And so she she had a thing where like she would be misunderstood as she would she would say like a an aphorism in a strange way and then a character would be like, "Oh, you mean this?" and then she would be like, "Is what I say." Oh, it's like And then I just like I say that unironically. It, I say, "Is what I say." It makes my like, heart happy to hear you say that. Cows and duck. <laughs> Oh, cousin Doug is what I say. (laughs) Beautiful. They're like, there was one episode where they were like, um, they were trying. They're like, yeah, they're this family's from a place we couldn't locate on a map. Like they really identify that they don't know where this family is from, and it just makes it so much better. Uh, That that shows really clever. I I hope it hasn't aged poorly somehow. Me too. I don't know if I've gone back to watch a full episode, but I will say that I think the podcast market might be primed for a Weekenders podcast. So keep that one close to your chest, and if if it ever, if you ever go anywhere with it, keep me in mind. <laughs> and that goes for anybody listening who decides to steal that idea. Like, just have me on the Weekenders podcast, yeah. and then I'll I'll keep mum about it from Jason. <laughs> so Falaw philosophy. Yes. This Arthur episode. This opening very similar to an earlier Arthur episode because Arthur is talking about how a lot of big achievements weren't appreciated in their time such as Galileo's discoveries and Beethoven's musical ability now this it's not beat for beat the same but it's very similar to an episode in season three called Arthur's treasure hunt where he makes the same assertion in fact I believe he talks about Galileo in that same episode 
And then he also references Sir Isaac Newton as like how much farther they could have gone if they didn't listen to their parents <laughs> or some such. So it's, you know, enough of the notes are changed that it's its own thing, but it's just like this feels very thematically similar <laughs> to something they've already done. And it's immediately I was like, hmm, didn't put me in the right frame of mind for the episode ahead. Not original enough. <laughs> well, and of course, it's season 14. I mean, it's almost surprising that they don't like inadvertently steal from themselves more often. Yeah, no, that that's that's my thing, right? Like I have I they get 100 free passes. Like once you make so many episodes, <laughs> how could you not like occasionally make a similar joke or a similar line? Right. And they're so yeah. And they're so good for it because a lot of the stuff they come up with is frequently very funny and original. So it's just like, ah, so you did something that was similar. It's like, ah, like you're you're fine. Yeah. Like I'm not not mad about it or anything. Oh, definitely. And and even and even then uh, DW graded Arthur's cold open for me and gave him a half star. Yeah, that happened. (laughs) (laughs) There's it's always very it's always it comes out of left field when they. Uh, admit that the cold open isn't real. Like it's like it's a it's an in universe uh, uh, filmed. Like it's a filmed thing. And so DW gives him a half star and cancels the rest of the cold open. the The actual matter of this episode has to do with Neil Gaiman. Actually, yeah. So it's a Sue Ellen episode. Sue Ellen goes to a book reading by Neil Gaiman. This is, I, I looked up his bibliography. So the book that he's reading in the show, it's called Instructions. It is an illustrated book that he was releasing around the time. So he is doing a reading of this book. And as he's doing a book signing, the whole idea is that he recommends that Sue Ellen try making a graphic novel, which is, so this episode coming out in 2010, graphic novel was still a little little strange to the ears of a lot of people at the time i mean like maybe not to me i don't think i i thought no no me neither i thought it was kind of surprising based on the time that the characters would have been that unfamiliar because 2000 like comic book movies were in full swing Mm -hmm. at that time and i think the term graphic novel was probably more in the in the zeitgeist than that uh, Arthur would let on. But I, I don't want to be a hater, but that was kind of jarring to me. <laughs> yes, it was to me too. And I, th- it, of course, living in 2022 when everybody knows what that is, I had to cast my mind back a little bit because, of course, in 2010, like 20 year old me who still, you know, has grease and pimples on his face, of course I know what a graphic novel is. I'm borrowing them every week from the library. Right, right. But I think it was still, we were still at a point where, like, you know, we're in 2022. Geek and nerd culture has subsumed, like, all culture. And now it just is culture. Yeah. But it was still it was still in process by then. You know, the Big Bang Theory, I think, had already come out. We're doing a lot of comic book movies, as you said, but we don't have the MCU as it is yet. We're just beginning that. And I think it was we were still dealing with the growing pains of, like, putting all of this nerd crap to put a defamatory umbrella on it uh, into, you know, mainstream culture. So I can definitely see that there would be definitely subsections of people who would be like, I don't understand. But the ways in which graphic novels misunderstood in this episode is a little hard for me to believe, especially for, like, children. Yeah. Where it's like, yeah, you only have to say it once and... It's pretty easy to get. Because again, just to add, I just I just looked it up and and superhero movies that were out that were released in twenty ten. Kick yes. kick ass. Mm-hmm. Scott Pilgrim versus the world. And Iron Man Two. So I don't know. Like I think it's like Scott Pilgrim was like the graphic novel in in Canada. And yes. and you know that like put it put like a lot of Toronto like hotspots on the map like in a more global sense, um, maybe, I don't know. To, at least to me, I, I was you know in Montreal. I was like so excited about Toronto. All this to say, the graphic novel thing was jarring, but I, it's not a huge deal. And Neil Gaiman is the perfect person to have in for a graphic novel episode. So yeah, mm-hmm. no, yeah, and it's it's just like. I mean, we'll we'll get into it. We'll get into it a little more. We see ads for his books in the store as well. And yep. this whole episode is very reverent 
of him. You know, it's he had a, you know, he recently had a book come out in 2008. His latest novel would have been the graveyard book. But, you know, we see we see some of his more well known to kids uh, yeah. literature. Uh, and it's very much like, oh, Neil Gaiman, such a terrific writer. So it's like if you if you're not crazy about Neil Gaiman, this is probably a bit of a tough watch. I'm kind of indifferent on him. I never really got into him all that much, but I have nothing against him. Oh, you haven't read so, uh, you haven't read his Sandmans. His oh, sand, oh no! His Sandman, <laughs> his Sandman. No, oh yes, of course I have. You know what? I just it just kind of flew out of my mind. Yeah. So yeah, the, I've read the whole thing of Sandman through once. I read Coraline for sure, and I've definitely seen the movie. And I saw the movie version of Mirror Mask, but I didn't read the book. Yeah, I think I loved Sue Ellen's take on <laughs> Coraline. Weird, but good. Or like disturbing, but good. <laughs> it was like very funny. <laughs> I laughed at that. And th- I think the w- one of the most unbelievable things in this episode, where there are a lot of unbelievable things, is that like good. <laughs> Good guy Neil Gaiman, yeah. like gifts Sue Ellen a signed copy of the Coraline graphic novel, which is like, oh come on, it's good stuff. Really? It's good. That was a good move on Neil Gaiman. He's having a great press tour for his new book in Elwood City. <laughs> yeah, like that that is a good, that is a good point. But it reminded me of like, there's a. I mean, I apologize. I have to get the wrestling reference in somewhere. There's a really like cheesy um, commercial that the that the WWF did in the 90s when like business was down and they were trying to put it across that like all oh, the the superstars of the WWF they really care about you they care about their fans so much where it's like their world champion Diesel is at an autograph signing uh-huh. and the kid and the kid goes to pay him now of course wrestlers I, th- this just is the way it is it's not meant to be derogatory but it's like they know how to how they know how to make a buck and they and they're they're out for money and it's just like that's it is what it is so <laughs> the commercial is like here you go big daddy cool and he like hands him a 20 he's like no nah, no nah, this one's on the house and it's like the world wrestling federation really cares Aww. Like, Ugh. it was also during the baseball strike so it was like unlike Unlike the baseball guys, we actually care about our fans. It's like, eh, gross. <laughs> so that's that's what I got is just like, you know, the big daddy cool Neil Gaiman puts his sunglasses down just like, nah, nah, this one's on the house, kid. Yeah. It's it's all to enrich you. So I was a little, little skeptical about that. <laughs> I love how against it you were. <laughs> I love how you much know, you hate. You hate Neil Gaiman, I think. <laughs> No, well, that's the thing is that, like, I, d- uh, I don't, <laughs> but it was the way in which they really, I, I'll use this again, they kissed up to him that I was like, you did this for Lance Armstrong, too, the, uh, and that didn't turn out great. For the listeners uh, who did not see, William just shifted his eye. or sorry, I just called you William, jeez Louise. That's fine. Will, that's Will fine. just shifted his eyes from left to right in such a way as if to say he hated <laughs> every second of what he was talking about. <laughs> Well, now I'll just have to uh, I'll have to make some quick on the fly notes to my uh, to my notes already. A little bit less inflammatory rhetoric against Neil Gaiman. I'll try to no. I think dampen that. I think it should be like a thing that you perpetuate. Like I think Neil Gaiman should be your antagonist for like every episode going forward. Like this should be the Arthur official Arthur podcast slash anti Neil Gaiman podcast. <laughs> oh boy. I'm gonna lose I'm gonna lose all of my female listeners right in one fell swoop. <laughs> um, no, it's I mean the the hottest take I have about Neil Gaiman is that like I read ten pages of American Gods and didn't like it. Wow, you heard it here first. In all seriousness, like I hope everyone knows that we're kidding. <laughs> like <laughs> Absolutely. I I meant it. I have nothing against it. Yeah, he's fine. There's nothing wrong with Neil Gaiman. We love Neil Gaiman on this podcast. Okay, well can't I can't I just be neutral? Can't I just be completely neutral? I yes. I oh give you permission god. to be neutral. Oh my god. This is this is already uh, Hey, you so, asked yes. me on here. This is your fault. I, d- I didn't think I didn't think that I was gonna get I don't know. This is this is proving to be more controversial than I w- ever would have dreamed. <laughs> so Sue Ellen gets an idea for her story. So she's she you know she's she writes she draws and Neil Gaiman 
uh, suggests you put it together in a graphic novel. Just like, a graphic novel? <laughs> just like, oh, brother. Uh, so she gets an idea for her story from, would you believe it, the local falafel truck proprietor, Mr. Contabulous. Oh, he has a name. He does, yeah. Mr. Contabulous. And she uses that later in her story when she represents him as the the great Contabulous. Whoa. Okay, I did not get that at all. Um, I didn't love Mr. Contabulous. Um, no? I don't know. I think because uh, he wasn't in the episode enough and, like, the accent was nondescript. I didn't I, – I don't know. It seemed like vi- – I, I'm too nervous about PC stuff. So when I saw it, it made me a little bit – uncomfortable but like Mm -hmm. maybe i'm being overly sensitive okay whatever (laughs) fair fair enough like it was it's long ago that you're just like well you weren't quite there yet. no the world is a very different place for sure it was a little it was a little borderline any of our greek listeners uh let me know what you thought yes of the portrayal of mr contabulous anyway to to your point uh he has a line where binky binky he's serving falafel and Binky asks for white sauce, or Binky asks for hot sauce, but Mr. Contabulous gives him white sauce because he has too much fire in blood. Yeah. <laughs> it's like he's in Anastasia or something. It's just like, so, and then Binky agrees. It's like, oh, maybe I do have too much fire in my blood. This is, uh, this is really tasty. Also, side note, I just like, falafel's not Greek, right? Like, falafel's definitely yeah. Middle Eastern. You're asking the wrong guy, Pat. I'm like... That that's another part of it. When you said the name, I was like, "Hang on a second. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong about that too. If I am, I love being wrong. Tell me I'm wrong. But that's what I think. <laughs> I think this has sort of been like a, this is a strange situation." Um. So Sue Ellen comes up with the idea of creating a story about circles and triangles and how they interact. Circles are a bit more peaceable, and triangles always have a point to make. Yeah. <laughs> they're very. They're very opinionated. It's gotta love a pun. Beautiful. And we have an Arthur meme alert here as Sue Ellen is sitting down at the bench and she's wondering, she's just like, ah, oh, this, this idea is stupid. But then Neil Gaiman disagrees with her. And as you may have seen on uh, a Twitter or perhaps an Arthur out of context reel on YouTube, Neil Gaiman, what are you doing in my falafel? <laughs> Uh, I'm very excited. I'm very excited for Lucas to see this. I think I I really need him to see. I need everybody to see what Neil Gaiman is doing in the in the falafel. It's fantastic. I love Neil Gaiman in a falafel. Just beautiful. Side note, by the way, I feel like Sue Ellen's graphic novel would do really well. Like I bet it would sell a lot of copies. Yeah, it's like simple, but like the art style is kind of cool. I was into it. I think you could also lean into the fact that it's done by an eight-year-old. Yeah, and you could probably like, you could do pretty well. I think so. That's that's a that's a that's a good point actually. Um, so yes, Neil Gaiman is in Sue Ellen's falafel because it's her inner Neil Gaiman, <laughs> and I found this very interesting. This has implications for the entire structure of Arthur, where you know Neil is you know Sue Ellen's like I don't I don't understand like what do you do? he's a very small Neil Gaiman in her falafel. He's just like oh excuse me, would you prefer this? special effects and then we get the traditional arthur wipe to fantasy the yeah and he's like is 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 that better and i was like what's happening but that was the weirdest part because it didn't that's normally what they do to cut or transition but nothing happens they don't cut to anything Mm -hmm. it was weird they just they just in they formally indicate that this is a fantasy for the benefit of sue ellen who just somehow so it's possible to perceive this in the Arthur universe it's possible to perceive the fantasies that are a part of every single episode yeah it was it was that was a weird moment for sure i i was very confused by that moment because it doesn't again it's like it's like that moment where you know they say that when you're having a dream and to recognize you're in the dream you should like you know pinch yourself or do something till and, and if you feel it you know, then you're not dreaming. And if you don't feel it, then you're in the dream. So too, it's like, if you can see the Arthur wipe sound effect thing, then you're already in the fantasy, which is Mm -hmm. strange. It's already, it's already too late. Yeah. (laughs) So the, the advice that that Neil gives her is to trust your heart and trust your story. Mm -hmm. And that's basically the theme of his advice as we see him throughout the rest of the episode. So Sue Ellen gets emboldened. She creates this graphic novel, but circles and the triangles, 
and she gives it to her friends, uh, Francine, Muffy, and Brain, who aren't really into the idea. No. In fact, a, a couple of them take offense to the oh, idea. Oh, yeah. They hate it. <laughs> they are not on board. <laughs> so first of all, F- Francine, what's a graphic novel? A novel with graphs? Yeah. And I just like sunk back into my chair. Sick like, oh, brother. burn. Take that, Sue Ellen. What are you doing? What are you doing? Math? Get out of here. Let's let's take the most literal reading of the term graphic novel, and that's like the that's like the only possible way that you can misunderstand what it means. And Francine feels like when she's told that she would be a triangle, she takes great offense to that. It's just like, I'm not a triangle. I'm the most circle person you'll ever meet. To which Muffy counters with, You're the most triangle person I've ever met. <laughs> um, Muffy doesn't think that there's any legs for this for a movie adaptation, which topical, as you said, uh, movies getting made into graphic novels, definitely around then still today. Yeah. Uh, so there is something of a, of a, of a cottage industry in that even back then. And the brain says that he refuses to be categorized with geometric shapes. Yeah. Good on brain. He's he's really, I mean, it's a very, it's a very binary choice. So he's thinking outside of this geometric binary such as it is yeah man everyone should be able to exist however they want to identify a shape or no shape but i will ask you do you think you're more a circle or a triangle i i i i what a good question you ask the good tough questions on this podcast mm-hmm. i identify as a um probably more of a circle because i don't take mm-hmm. i don't i i'm like I have points, but I don't take myself too seriously. You know, I like to I like to be silly. So I and I feel like the triangles weren't super silly. No, they were very uh, aggressive, as we yeah, see later strict, on. You know, I also I also feel I'm a bit more of a circle. Yeah. Although I guess it depends on the situation. I think we all have circles and triangles within us. It just depends on the uh, the motivation and the uh, emotions behind it. I think I think we can all be triangles about something. <laughs> I'm probably a triangle about Arthur. I'm a triangle about Digimon, as we found there out. There you go. Yeah. That's what we, yeah. That's the Digi, the Digi, oh, and there's Digimon Tri. So, Digimon Triangle. Oh, my God. This the is, podcast. this is the, the Illuminati's real. <laughs> I did the thing. I did the thing on camera. Oh, baby. This, this discourages Sue Ellen a little bit. She really wants everybody to like it. And she talks with her inner Neil again at the Sugar Bowl, who tells her to not worry about what other people think. And not to give up because and and he does admit I was afraid that not afraid but I I figured that the advice would be like like don't worry whatever other people think I'm just like oh great thank you so much I won't worry about what other people think ever again but he does Neil Gaiman does admit that like of course as a writer and you could put this out to anybody else who is creative of course you want people to like to like it but you can't let the thought of people not liking it or misunderstanding it stop you from being creative so i thought that that was a really good a a better message to push of like of course when you make something you want it to be accepted but it can't always happen but you shouldn't have that stop your inner creativity absolutely i think that i think without getting like uh, without getting like too i'm not trying to be like too off course or like too heady about all this but like yeah 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 um the quote i heard about creativity that really helps me in in moments where i'm second guessing a decision or or or, you know that's putting out something altogether is um is that perfection is the enemy of progress like you shouldn't worry about something being perfect you know you uh it because that will hold you back from trying from finishing a podcast episode or a video or a movie or whatever pick a drawing graphic whatever you're making and um, I think that that logic or that advice also applies to Sue Ellen's uh, situation, right? Like she shouldn't worry about what other people will think, not because that doesn't matter, but because it will stop her from it'll she'll judge herself so much that maybe she won't finish what she started. And that's not good. Exactly. And no, certainly I don't think it's it's too heady. There is a there's a really great quote from. Yes, uh, I just had to quickly find it. It's from uh, it's from a video by uh, YouTuber H Bomber Guy. Okay, that I think is really um, 
creating art is like jumping off a cliff and building your wings on the way down. If you want to only start when you know exactly how to get everything right, you never actually will. You never really know what you're doing until after you've started doing it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the uh, the <laughs> the analogy I use in building my my career is uh, is building a plane while flying it. That's what I worked for somebody mm-hmm. who said that, and uh, I really like that analogy. So that yeah, and I th- and I think that uh, Inner Neil, she says thanks, Inner Neil, uh, <laughs> is is right on the money, and it's, and obviously it's a very good message to send to kids. He also gives advice about drinking uh, lukewarm uh, drinks, specifically smoothies. He says you don't want to be stuck with a warm smooth- smoothie. It's like drinking fruity bath water. Ugh, gross. Which which I mean, fair. Like I I don't normally let my smoothies go cold, but yeah, I mean. <laughs> it's not not very pleasant to think about. So Sue Ellen uh, is emboldened by this, and she finish she finishes her story, and we see all throughout these little cartoon asides of how the story is shaping up, and it, it's you know it's pretty basic stuff. It's like the circles opposed to the triangles, and then I think near at the end they find a way to coexist together, but she ends up losing her copy of the story in in her journal, and. Uh, she actually meets Neil Gaiman in real life right before this at the falafel truck, and then she re- she wants to show him her graphic novel, but she's lost it. So her and Neil Gaiman go to find it. Uh, Neil apparently needs hot sauce on his falafel because his blood is cold. <laughs> and that's him. That's him who said that. That's not me or the Mr uh, the the Mr Contabulous the, the falafel truck owner yeah yeah i think it's that's him that's got to be an allusion to like the like his his horror genre that he lives in right like the cold blood mm. thing he's also very slight he, uh, he's a very slight man he's a little pale so okay he i i mean i buy, I buy that too right so maybe neil gaiman they're implying that he's a vampire maybe <laughs> he you know he, you, you frequently see him wearing black uh huh He's British. Vamp- he's pale. That's got vampire written all over him. I mean, yeah. yeah. The t- he is out during. He is out during the day, though. It's true, but they're not. Notice how they don't have any. Oh no, never mind. I was going to say there's no garlic, but then like sometimes there's garlic in falafel. So. Mm-hmm. We need to. We need to get. We need to get in. We need to get into his falafel order and, and really get some answers here. You, you got to go. Uh, you got to consult your patrons on this one. I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Does Neil Gaiman take garlic on his falafel? If not. I think we have I think we're on to something here. Definitely. Um the uh Mr. Contabulous refers to Sue Ellen's friends as Rich One, Bossy One, and Big Head. Beautiful. Uh mwah, he's, mwah, he's mwah. Saw, fantastic. <laughs> it's very succinct. Uh apparently they have the journal and Sue Ellen is very uh, upset about this because she just thinks that, well, they didn't like it before, they won't like it now. And <laughs> It's her and Neil Gaiman hiding out in the bushes as Francine Muffy and Brain are actually uh, fervently discussing the book. They have a, they they mostly like it and they have their own opinions on it. Like Francine thinks sees it this way, Brain sees it this way. Muffy sees suddenly sees uh, uh, 3D CGI uh, movie potential in this graphic novel. Yeah, this was a, a a moment in the show. I understand it's a TV show first. Second, right. I understand that they it's like an eleven minute chunk and they have to progress the story, but I didn't understand that all that notwithstanding, I didn't quite understand what the turn was. What made them suddenly like the show? Uh the book, the graphic novel. I think just that it maybe that it was fully realized. Like they were able to read it to the end because I think Sue so, the one that Sue Ellen showed them, I don't not even certain it was done. I think it was just kind of her ideas mm. and this was like getting to read it from beginning to ostent- to ostensible end now we d- another great quote here from neil gaiman uh th- when you know I, I i believe it's francine she's just like i can't wait to see what happens next and neil gaiman says the three magic words that every writer wants to hear what happens next yeah like, ooh, like ooh, like hey I don't care for all of his stuff but like obviously neil gaiman's a talented writer and he has a he has a gift for that kind of uh, very, very pithy, very um, summit is summative a, a word? Boy, that would be silly of me if it's not. A uh, he has he has a, he has a way of putting emotions into like a single line that I think is really effective here. I it made me think about what that moment made me think. What are other groups of three words together 
that writers would want to hear. Can you think of any? I think we should do at least one or two extra. Advance in cash. <laughs> um, Here's some money. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've got it. Oh yeah, Ooh. yeah. He, he, that's, that's, like an, that's, that's like an actual good answer. Yeah, I'm, be, I, I'm, I'm being, I'm being sardonic because I also because I also write, and so yeah, just give me money is yeah. my three words. But um, here's some snacks. Here's some. Mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm, that would be good. Mm-hmm. Um, it's tax deductible. <laughs> uh, I didn't do too bad on my taxes this year. Um, Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so yeah, Sue Ellen is emboldened to keep doing this, and we end with the with the book the book closing. And I just had the note here that you know we'll talk about our feelings on the episode later, but they had Neil Gaiman like really involved in this episode. Yeah. I figured that he would just show up for that one like Neil Gaiman, what are you doing in my falafel? But he's like running around, he's giving advice, he's here from like the beginning to the end. They really got their use out of him. Yeah, that's that's that was my that was definitely one note I had also was that normally like it's not they don't always use their cameos as much as they use Neil Gaiman. Mhm. It remind it reminds me a lot of the episode they had with Philip Seymour Hoffman where he was around more than you would think for someone as high profile as as he was and I'm I'm really I'm always really glad to see when they maximize the potential because every once in a while you get somebody like uh um I think it was was it Frank Gary the artist and he's just like he's in a couple of scenes and just like eh, you know it's not really an actor Neil Gaiman also not what I would say an actor but he at least put some oom- he put some oomph into there <laughs> and he uh he made the most out of it Definitely yeah It's also just like I think that um author cameos make a lot of sense like especially someone like yes. Neil Gaiman make a lot of sense and it's a good fit for the Arthur universe yes that's a really good point in fact it makes me wonder like Arthur has had so many guest stars it's almost strange that you know you can't say I don't think I wouldn't guess that half of them are known primarily as authors I think some of them are but you know he's the Arthur is pulled from all other parts of culture but it's such a it's easy to forget that Arthur is such a literacy based show and that it's like its roots are in literacy that when you have something like this, it's like, oh, yeah, Arthur's a show about reading. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Arthur, Arthur's the, the library card thing or something, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They go to the oh. library sometimes. Oh, Arthur Reed. Oh, you don't yeah. you don't think that's could that be why his name? What's that? Is his name Reed because of reading? I, I so I I've been taking notes on this. Okay. Um I I really I really think that I'm on that we're on to something here. Mm-hmm. I don't want to say too much over the air. Okay, okay. They're always listening. But I really I th- I think if you're not right, you're like on the path to it. So like okay. we'll talk we'll talk after the podcast. Okay, okay, maybe. definitely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh don't worry I'll I'll I'll, I'll edit that out. Good good good. Um yeah. yeah. <laughs> um okay so we are going to uh I'll ju- I'll just quickly say did you uh, did your copy have and now a word from us kids? Yes, it did. Oh it, oh it did great. Okay. Yeah. And now a word from us kids. Mm-hmm. And now a word from us kids. I don't have that much to say about it this time. Sometimes the word from us kids, you know, the word from us kids uh, giveth and then the word from us kids taketh away. This one was just kind of like, oh, yeah, the kids are in class and they're making graphic novels, and it, which is a cool assignment. But it was just like, yeah, you know, they're both making friends and <laughs> are you friends? Are you <laughs> are are we are we trashing the kids' graphic novels now? Dude, we've been <laughs> trashing a word from us kids. No, I'm kidding. We 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 try to be very fair, but. You know, it's it, and this is not this is not a commentary on the children. Uh huh. We ne- we never we don't do we don't do commentaries on on the kids. Okay. It's just like sometimes they say something funny, and it's like aha, tee hee, all the all this kind of stuff. But it's more of just like sometimes these situations that they find themselves in are more interesting than others. With whereas this one is like, it's a pretty it's a pretty tried and true word from us kids trope of like here is a assignment that corresponds to the episode you just watched yeah i thought it was cool i was like damn like i as a kid that was making 
comic books in at, at around that time, like drawing my mm. own and illustrating, uh, writing and illustrating my own comic books. I, I would mm. have loved to be able to do that as an assignment in elementary school. That's awesome. I mean, yeah, I was also like figuring out and just from reading comic books of like, how do how do panels work? How do you like l do it like your own really amateurish panel layout? How to uh, you know make a superhero design? And yeah, it's 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 always really cool to see, even if kids who don't continue with art later in their career, just uh, later in their lives, I should say, um, to see their kind of drawings does remind me of that a little bit. It's just also like mm, we've had more interesting subject matters but it's not the kids fault it's never the kids fault this is my favorite take that you've had all episode <laughs> <laughs> that the now a word from us kids activity is subpar <laughs> well in other ones they got them on like a like a like a sh like a ship they've got them like going out into the world and uh -huh. like going to cool places and some and then like I remember way back in season one, they, it's like, you come up with a jingle for Crunch Cereal. I'm like, okay. Like, we're, we're, do, like, we're doing some rapping. We're doing some pop songs. I'm uh -huh. just like, you know, this one's just like, yeah, it's you know, a little drawn. A little snap, crackle, and pop action. Something something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, well, normally, this is where I would cut to a uh, commercial. Uh -huh. A commercial for all of the various ways in which you can uh, interact with the show. But once again, since I have you here, sure. I, I wonder if I can just drop this in the chat and I can get you to read out the various ways in which our listeners can uh, support us and uh, and talk to us. I mean, Will, I am evidently, I am your Neil Gaiman for this episode because you are using and abusing. <laughs> what, what does that mean? Now, hang on. <laughs> Now you now you purported you purported some <laughs> ill feelings toward Neil Gaiman. I have no ill feelings toward I, you. Now we're talking about use and abuse. What? What, what do you, you get your? You I'm get your the one that was. Straight, I'm the one that was a, the fan of Neil Gaiman. You were the one hating on him this whole time. Hating on him. <laughs> no, I'm just. I was alluding to how like they Neil Gaiman was very involved in the episode. So mm -hmm. too am I heavily involved in this epi in the episode of Elwood City Limits that we are now yeah. making. That's what I, all I was saying. I see. Uh, I but see. I'm, I would be more than happy, again, as I've said to you and Lucas, anything I can do in my limited powers to help support your really cool podcast, I would be more than happy to do. So you can support this podcast by following on Facebook. We're at Elwood City. They're at Elwood City Limits. Twitter at ECL Podcast. Tumblr, Elwood City Limits. IG, as the kids say, Elwood City Limits. If you want to send them an email, drop them a line at elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. And this podcast, the one you're listening to now, is available on iTunes, on Spotify, and on your favorite podcast platforms. These include youtube.com slash Elwood City Limits. And if you want that extra sweet, sweet content, check out the Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Elwood City Limits. How'd I do? Great. Now, can you backfill in? Uh, hey, it's Jason Schwimmer from the Finding DW podcast. <laughs> you don't think and people will be able to tell it's me? Have I not read? Just in Oh no, no! I'm gonna, I'm gonna use this. I'm gonna, cl I'm gonna clip this out. You're get, you are part of the show forever, my friend. Um, okay, perfect. Okay, great. Um, so what do I do? What do you want me to do? My, hey, it's Jason Schwimmer, and I'm from the Finding DW podcast. Hey, it's Jason Schwimmer, and I'm from the Finding DW podcast. Yeah, and I should be able to splice that. It, hey, listeners, check this out. You just got to see an editing session live on your podcast. <laughs> This podcast is completely off the rails. I hope it's what you wanted. It's everything I wanted and more. Good. And you're t you want to talk about off the rails. Uh -huh. Well, that sounds like a great time to get into the Great Lint Rush. Yeah. Oh, boy. Are we are we going to do that? Do you want to deep dive into that? So what? So The Pal episodes are very – I because this is, again, past my era of watching Arthur. The, mm. the, the, the Pal episodes are something. I don't I don't know. There's something else. 
There's something all right. I don't know quite what. We've had a little bit of a fraught relationship with them. Okay. Lucas and I, we kind of, uh, we're not so crazy about them. They get a little bit like, uh, I think the last one we did, it's a little bit rug ratsy at times, okay. which is like, you know, if we want to hear babies talk, like, it's just like, eh, I'd rather watch rug rats. But, you know, there's a, there's a lot to talk about. So, Let's go from the beginning. The Great Lint Rush. So the Reed family are missing a lot of their socks because Pal has taken them for the sock market. Now, this is from a previous episode um, from the Great Sock Mystery. This is from seasons and seasons ago when, you know, we did the the Secret Lives of Dogs and Babies episode where it's like, oh, it turns out that Pal and Kate can talk to each other. Right. And then they got an idea. <laughs> An awful, horrible, no good idea. No, I'm just kidding. It's not that bad. But um, the, I suppose they decided that, like, hey, we can do that again. And, I mean, it must have been that they got a good response to it because they've been bringing this back, I'd say, at the rate of, like, maybe one or two per season. I think there might be seasons between that might not have one. But they bring it back, like, every now and then. And there was an episode where Powell and the neighbor's dog, Amigo, went to the sock market uh, and met Alan Green Spaniel. Um, <laughs> Jason just rolled his eyes. Um, so th- that, that's the idea is that they, that they trade they trade socks. And so Powell takes all of these socks to the sock market, but he's too late. The sock market has crashed and it's taken over by... Mr. Toad, who has also been seen on the show. He is a toad who frequently has a hot dog poking out of his mouth in place of a cigar, and he speaks with, like, a 1920s Boardwalk Empire accent. <laughs> and how, how, how are you feeling about this so far? I got to say, the right off the top, seeing all of, our, all of the Reed family's bare feet was so disturbing Aww. for some reason. And it it really oh. colored my viewing. I was so thrown off and weirded out by seeing their toes. They, their human feet were so weird looking to me. It's that uncanny the, valley nonsense that makes like the robot and iRobot so it makes Sunny and iRobot so disturbing. You know what I mean? As DW says, call the feet police. Yeah, that was great. I I mean, I have a soft. Sp- I love. DW is great. She's fantastic. But yeah, her feet are not. I don't. I don't care for them. Nope. Not into no, it. No. We as a, yeah. The, and I also never thought that we'd even like continue a thread from one of these Pal and Kate episodes. Like this is a direct follow up to the Great Sock Mystery, as I said. So the entire this and this is the episode. This is the episode. This is the episode of Arthur we're talking about. Is we're talking about the dogs and the baby. They're going to try to convince Mr. Toad to give the sock market back. And even just reading these notes, I'm like, this is this reads like a different show. Oh, yeah. It's like, even though it's the same characters. So Amigo suggests that they go see Ben St. Bernard Key. Now, okay, do you know, how good are you on, like, financial figures? That's what I was going to say is that I feel... Like, I can't pretend to know all the references. I like the names all sound vaguely familiar and I understand what they're doing, like with the puns. And that's yeah. great. Like, I, I rolled my eyes, but it's a great, like, I love puns. I, I, so it's all wonderful to me. But yeah, no, I, I don't, I didn't catch all the references, I don't think. Okay. So this is, so Ben St. Bernard Key, the chair pet of the footwear reserve, right, is based, is based on a man named Ben Bernanke who is the chairman of the Federal Reserve at this time. So they so, so Federal and Foot, is, that's what they did? Uh, yeah, Footwear and Federal. Got it. Yeah. And, like, I don't know economics well enough, uh-huh. but I'm guessing this whole thing is, like, meant to be something of an allusion to the 2008 financial crisis, <laughs> I think. If it is, what a take. Like, to squeeze this into an Arthur episode. I mean, like, they do this, though, on this show. Like, they yeah. like they allude to real-life things and adult themes, and it's it's just something they do on the show. It's actually not inconsistent, I don't think, with, with Arthur as a show in general. No, certainly not. It's just that, like... Y- <laughs> It doesn't make it what? less strange. <laughs> I'm trying to I'm trying to imagine the adults that had Arthur on for their kid. Right. 
and they understood the Ben Bernanke reference. Yeah. And enjoyed it. Uh huh. Like laughed at it. Yeah. You know, it's like I re- I recognized that it was a reference. I didn't get the reference, and I didn't really laugh at it. Yeah, me too. So there's like three levels that you have to clear before you're like actively enjoying what they're doing. And I I don't mean that to sound derogatory. It's just like, oh my god, this is like. Who is this? Who is this for? That's I think. You know? That's I think the takeaway. It's like I'm with you. It's not. I, I think that it, we we should be clear. I think we're on the same page, you and I. Like, if if I may mm-hmm. tell, like, yes. I don't want to speak for you, but I no, I, it's, I it's think right. that we are not criticizing Arthur in a negative way, but are are gently asking who is this this episode? Who's the primary demographic for this kind of an episode? Because to me. <laughs> It feels more like it's a, it's almost like a Simpsons episode rather than, mm. you know, like in, in that it's, you know, a kid can watch The Simpsons, but like there's this other stepped up level and like The yeah. Simpsons is more for like an older crowd, like, or, or can be yeah. for an older crowd. Like, so too is this episode sort of like it's babies and dogs, but it's like, it's, it's, it's sort of like this pastiche or this, you know, so it's very strange, I think. It's obtuse references to chairman of the Federal Reserve. Yeah, like I, no kid is going to – I mean, I didn't even get all the references, right? Like neither no. – you know, so it's it's just very uh, – it's it's notable, I will say. Thanks to the Arthur Wiki for helping with some of this. I really needed it. <laughs> um, Amigo references that there was a similar event, the Great Chili Toe Scare of 1929. Uh-huh. I wrote in I wrote in parentheses in my notes, the Great Depression, question mark, question mark, question mark, question mark. <laughs> And apparently that is what it is. Like, again, according to the Arthur Wiki, it's like he references a time when the sock market crashed and nobody had socks. And so everybody's feet hurt and they smelled worse than usual. And then there's a real there's a line in here. Okay, you mentioned seeing the reeds as feet was weird uh-huh. then we have amigo saying normally dogs enjoy the like smelly feet we enjoy smelly feet like a ripe camembert what's that and i'm just what's that i'm looking around at nobody and being like who what's happening what's <laughs> happening <laughs> we're talking about feet smelling like cheese and ben saint bernard keys over there and i'm looking for a life preserver i'm just like please please something <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot. It's a lot. It's like the first two minutes of this uh, after the cold open. Yeah, and I feel like these a lot of these references are thrown so quickly, and they're said in in these kind of like accents yeah. at times that makes it, mm. it it does make it harder to like catch them as and register them as jokes or references or whatever. You know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, we see. Um, now, I, I I wrote here's a cameo, but actually she's in this for quite a while. Uh, DW's uh, toad, pet toad Toadie oh, yeah. uh, shows back up, which I always have to note because when we when we covered it way back in 2016, when we covered that episode, um, I, I asked, does Toadie ever show up again? And the listeners that we had at the time were like, oh, yeah, Toadie comes back. I'm like, really? And, yeah, so Toadie does come back within these, like, DW and Pal-focused episodes. Um, so Pal is going to go speak with Mr. Toad to get, to have him relinquish the sock market. Uh, this is the first time – I just wanted to note this. It's the first time he refers to himself as Pal Reed. Yeah, I, I thought that was notable, too. I thought that was actually really interesting. Because yeah, normally it's just Pal, but he gives his his full name is Pal Reed. Yeah, which uh, that's that's I always think of that. That's the Tumblr tag that I use on any Pal uh, posts that I put on there. But it's like no, actually that's his that's his government name. Is can- s- it's, such as it is. It's canon. <laughs> so Pal meets with Mister Toad, and in trying to negotiate the sock market back, he instead uh, loses his shirt, so to speak, loses his fur. I, I don't know. Uh, and loses the family house to Mr. Toad. Now, of course, Pal has no claims to the Reed family house, so instead what that means is that Mr. Toad is going to have a bunch of toads living in the house as, like, pests. So yeah. <laughs> this... Okay, I also... All right. I wrote I write down the broad, the broad strokes of what's happening, and then I have little notes in here, and there's so many little notes because, okay, first of all, mm-hmm. the... So I, I wrote here the inner workings of the animal world of Arthur. Very, it's very creative in this whole sequence where Pal goes to meet Mister Toad. Mister Toad, his his office is in 
the equivalent of a skyscraper like a tree. Yes. And so there's like a lizard guarding the door who's security. He takes Pal over to an elevator. There's like other animals working in desk p- clerk positions. And Mr. Toad lives in like a loft in the tree. It's just like it's creative. But I also wrote it's very punchy of just like we're just getting kind of weird here, man. Yeah, and that's the, this is the stuff again. Like I think it's it's important to note that like while we are criticizing this, it's incredibly creative and really fun to yes. watch at times. Just because it's like oh, this is like now we're in like SpongeBob or like Adventure Time <laughs> territory. Like we are just yeah. off the rails here now. It's very um. It's it's visually interesting, yeah, if nothing else. Totally. Now I have to mention this, or else I'm sure that many of our listeners will for me. If you really want to get granular about the animal hierarchy in Arthur, uh, which is something that has haunted us for six years. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So there's animal people. Correct. There's funny animals. There's like Arthur, DW, the Reeds, etc. You have animals that have a degree of agency. There's Pal, there's Mr. Toad, there's the other dogs in the show who can speak to each other and can speak to babies, but are generally seen as animals. They just have a rich inner life that a certain level of consciousness cannot comprehend. (laughs) And then we have, when Pal is in this meeting with Mr. Toad, there's just a fly, and Mr. Toad eats the fly. So then there's animals that are animals. There are animals who are not deemed worthy enough to have sentience. We hope. We don't hear the fly speak. But we have to assume that it's basically like nothing. Or else Mr. Toad just killed someone. You know? That's so, so we have so <laughs> dark. Three, three levels of the animal hierarchy. And it's really... It's too much to think about at one time sometimes. That is so dark and so funny. <laughs> I did not catch that at all. <laughs> Um, for, unfortunately, I did. I, I need to be thinking about this at all times. I'm not presenting any sort of compelling statement or thesis on this. I'm just noting it for the record as the kind of the one of our I think one of the biggest ideas when Elwood City Limits is said and done is introducing the idea of the animal hierarchy to the Arthur fandom. If not by that name, then at least kind of continuing the conversation of like, you know, the classic Mickey and Pluto was like, well, why does Mickey walk Pluto? That sort of thing. Or why does Goofy walk Pluto? Totally. And like into the Arthur world. Yeah. And then also, I guess an int- I'm, I'm curious if you know, is if this is, in fact, a murder <laughs> or or it can't or be. like is it, ca- it can't be. I think I think it, it, it can't be because it's a children's show. But I think it just implies that there is another sub realm of animal existence. OK, where OK. You just don't you just exist as animals do with us in the real world. Got it. Got it. I guess. It's, it's some, I mean, something I've always thought about that's on the subject sort of is like in the world of Pokemon in that universe, mm-hmm. are there animals too? Because I'm pretty sure there yeah. are episodes where you see birds flying that aren't yeah. like Pidgeys. And it's I something I've, I think about more than I'm proud to admit <laughs> that I've spent time and, thinking about this. <laughs> and then with Pokemon, there are like those that can talk. Like sure, it, like yeah, the psychic Pokemon that can like just speak into your mind, yeah, yeah, or like the movie exclusive Pokemon that can just talk, yeah, yeah. Anyway, anyway, or Meowth, yes, can just Meowth, talk. Yeah, who just will himself to talk, yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is all just ideas to present. It's just, uh, it's just me scattering the bird seed. Right. I'm, I don't. I'm sorry. That sounds demeaning. I don't mean to say that about our listeners, but it's just like it's just me. Offering more ideas, and I feel like people more dedicated than us will will surely run with it. And I just wanted to put that out there to show that, yes, it never leaves my mind. I'm always thinking about it. I look forward to the think pieces, and feel free to cite us. We're happy to be in your Please. bibliography. <laughs> some of our listeners are talented writers. We should really get some think pieces out there. Sure. Um, Pal, yes, Pal loses his shirt, so to speak, because Mr. Toad offers him a... Uh, wonderful, like, cigar box of wieners, mm-hmm. of, like, cocktail wieners, and Pal crumbles immediately. He later admits, I'm a terrible business dog. <laughs> um, so, yes, the Toads, like, Mr. Toads, I don't think they're related to him, but they look similar to him. Mm-hmm. A toad infestation in the Reed house 
this would be terrifying. So, like, I've had, obviously, in real life, like, run-ins, like, with mice. We, my wife and I lived at an apartment where we had a cockroach infestation, ah, and that was terrible. Right, yeah. A toad infestation? Terrifying. There's, because we got, like, toads living in mugs. We have toads living in... Oh my god! Like they're like they're nice cartoony toads with like big smiles, so that softens it a bit. But I'm thinking about like if these are like real dead eyed toads, I'm like I'm running and I'm never coming back. Oh, it's terrifying! It was the, it's the worst. It's like it oh that would be so creepy and terrible. I I don't yeah. There's no other way to put it. It's just, it it just put that in my mind. I'm like oh, almost made me sick to think about. So what Pal and company realize they need to do Kate's in on this as well they you know they think about how they can get the um they have to pay uh Mr. Toad 10 socks in a week or else uh he he's going to have even more there's like another type of frog that's going to be moving in (laughs) and pal's very concerned he doesn't want to steal any more socks and he's concerned that like Arthur won't be able to do his homework because of all of the toads and frogs in the house so instead, they come up with the idea. Uh, the, you know, we have a little economics 101 class here as Kate and Pal and Amigo decide that they need to create an artificial need for something. When they create an artificial need of something they have a lot of, then Mr. Toad will be tempted to take that as payment instead of socks. And they do so with lint. There's a lot of lint around the house. So. They create like a grassroots. I can't believe I'm saying this. They create a grassroots movement among the among the animals they know. They go to um, we see Killer, who is a dog that belongs to Grandma Thora, and they convince her to spread the word that like lint is the new big thing. And we see it later among like cats and dogs and animals talking about how cool lint is. And Mister Toad begins to be convinced that there is some kind of value in it, and it's like it's so it's it's so heady it's like i was far older than arthur watching age when i when i came to realize it's just like yeah money is only valuable because we think it is yeah i mean it's it's uh it, again like in in the adult world and looking at it, it, it with a 2022 lens i immediately thought oh this is like pal just thought of nfts <laughs> like <laughs> oh, oh no nf toads nf toads uh, there you go see but, but that would that would have been eerily prescient if he's just like i just have to convince mr toad that the, he actually owns this image right i mean this, but that's that's this jpeg yeah exactly um which begs ugh. the question like is a kid following this plot at this point <laughs> So I ha- yeah I had the note here of just like I feel like this is trying to be educational about the stock market which I think that you can do that you can explain stocks and the stock market and these these quote unquote complicated um, ideas in a way that is accessible to children I feel like there is a way you can break this down I've played I remember I played computer games when I was little that aimed to break down what a trading market is Mm -hmm. in very simple terms. Right. But it's so obfuscated by like all of the puns of like, instead of money, it's lint or socks. And then, you know, it's, you know, going back to Ben St. Bernard key and, uh, you know, creating artificial demand with cats and dogs. And I'm like, it's kind of confusing. Like, I'm just like, so wait, this is supposed to mean this, but also it's supposed to mean this. Like, it doesn't completely fit, and it just kind of ended up being confusing. First of all, obfuscated, great word. I just looked it up, and it's like, wow, that's a fantastic word. Um, I have an English major. Well, so there, it has you, to be used for something. You are flexing, my friend. It is great. You have my tip, my hat to you. Second of all, I feel the need to, at the, because you use such a great word, I feel the need to voice an anxiety I've been thinking about for thirty minutes now, maybe more. When I <laughs> okay. when I said that this that this episode being about the stock market is is pastiche, but I misspoke. Ooh. It is a parody. It is not parody. pastiche. And I apologize, and I feel dumb, but at least I've corrected myself. <laughs> You're very honest. I misuse word, big words all the time, and I just pretend I know what I'm talking about. You, much more honorable than an English major, <laughs> note when you've made a mistake. It's, it's because I, I find, um, 
Like I've, I, as an adult, I've been a terrible reader in my twenties. Like in my twenties, I was a horror. Like I barely, like I did not read a lot. And if I did, it was like self help books and like I didn't yes. read a lot of nonfiction. And so I'm, I'm graphic novels. I read sure comics, yes. But now I'm getting back into um, like nonfiction and books again, and uh, I'm expanding my vocabulary. And it's been a lot of fun adding new ver- words to my lexicon, and I try to use these words correctly. So I look up new words when I don't know them. Okay. Yeah. Anyways. Yeah, it's it's never it's never a bad idea. Word a day calendars, as much as they can be a joke, are like actually good. Like it's always it's never a bad idea to. Increase your wordiness, as as Homer would say. Um, <laughs> it's an- just a couple of just a couple other quick notes. Uh, Mr. Toad and Toadie are apparently married. This is continuing a a story thread from a previous Pal and Kate episode. I think it might have been the Great Sock Mystery, uh-huh. where Toadie returns after all of these years, and they Mr. Toad and Toadie apparently know each other. So. It is their story has continued as such that Toady is apparently I, I say married because like she she's taking on just like how come you haven't bought me any lint like it's a real like uh, broad stereotype of a married couple right so right like, all right I, I guess that's where we are and the, yeah the essential thing is that they the, their their bid works they create enough artificial demand for lint that it is now uh, accepted by Mr. Toad as a substitute for socks. And now it's actually becoming popular in its own right. As like they're using it for like fashion. They're creating like hats and like jackets out of it and stuff. And th- I mean, yeah, that's that's basically it. The only other thing I had to say was that Pal and Amigo do like a high high five, high paw, and it was very cute. Yeah, no, it's it, this this whole episode, top to bottom, is is very cute. Uh, at, 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 po- at points, I would say. I think I think you're quite kind to it. But now is the point in the episode, I think, unless you have anything else to say about the Great Lint Rush. Uh, I don't know. I, Just any other uh, episode I, observations before we talk about, before we uh, rev- give our thoughts on the episode as a whole. I should sure. that for a second. Um, no, I feel like we did a good job covering it all. I wish I had something more interesting to say but it's been so much fun just t- talking about these episodes i feel i feel pretty good well we're not quite done yet. i know I'm i know st- i know you're I'm, right yeah no it's, it's all good i'll throw it to you first Phila philosophy jason uh-huh. now this now this is as you said this is far past when you would have stopped watching arthur yeah i didn't see this the first time until today either so this is my first time watching it too right but returning returning to arthur a full episode of arthur we start with Phila philosophy what did you think about it? Again, this is if if your audience is not turned on me yet, <laughs> this is probably where the rest of them will go. Um, I, to be honest, I wasn't jazzed about this episode as a whole. Oh. Um, I I don't know. I wasn't super into it. I think that um, I loved having the the like having a graphic novelist as you know relevant as Neil Gaiman was exciting. I think that was a really good and, as I said, like re- re- a relevant cameo. Uh, it was cool to have a secondary character like Sue Ellen, Sue Ellen get her time in the sun. But overall, I wasn't super into it. But again, I'm not – like this was past my time. I have no nostalgic relationship mm-hmm. with this episode, and I just didn't – I don't know. It didn't really do anything for me. What about you? Do you, th- do you think that – I mean, I, I don't normally, you know th- – uh, uh, I don't normally question like I like offer questions sure. since you're since you're a guest and that was your take on it. I guess I'm a little curious of do you think there would have been an angle to it that would have interested you more? Like do you think that it was maybe missing a turn that would have specifically appealed to you a little bit more? Well, again, appeal to me as a 30-year-old man, like yeah, sure. maybe some like but, I mean, more but, more conflict would have been like, you know, again, I, I think yeah the plot of this episode like why do they suddenly decide that the the episode that the um, that sue ellen's story is interesting uh brain and francine and um and muffy um i wasn't Mm -hmm. totally convinced that it was like all of a sudden just because more of the story was written that they were just into it okay um and and i don't know like i wasn't but look all this to say like I am fiercely loyal to Arthur. Like I, I this show, oh, oh, like I, I, I always hesitate 
uh, to say anything negative about Arthur because this this is a show that I I owe a lot to and I respect everyone who worked on the show. But not, I, you know, like not every episode can be a 10 out of 10. And this one's just not that for me. That doesn't mean it's sure. not for someone else. Right. And I don't want you to feel like you can't be honest about how you feel about it. Because goodness knows in the, the amount of times that Lucas and I have done this, we come across episodes where we're just like, this is bad. Okay. We're just like, I didn't like this one. Okay. And it's, and it's, and it's fine. We're not, obvi- like, we wouldn't. I'm defending this against no one. No, literally, no one is saying this. So I, I don't want to get too defensive or anything. Yeah, but I, I, I encourage you to be honest because the reason that we've made this entire podcast is because we love Arthur. Yeah, and but to me, as I hope more people are subscribing to, loving something doesn't mean not being critical of it. Of course, and. And of course, being critical of it, but in being critical of it, we are not taking away the fact that talented people worked on this, including animators and writers and voice actors and producers alike. And that you know, it never enters into the com- conversation of like this is incompetent or <laughs> this was like poorly run. It's just like no, it's just like maybe it just didn't work. F- and I will tell you why for X, Y, and Z, as you just did. And it can come down to the fact that sometimes it's just like, uh, if this wasn't a different show that was maybe for a different audience or age group, like maybe I would have liked it a bit more, which is totally fine. Like we have so as men in our 30s, we have so many options for entertainment that it's just like, you know, sometimes a kid's show doesn't really scratch it. Yeah. Sometimes. But it also makes it more special when it does. Totally. Like sometimes I watch an Arthur episode. And I'm like, I genuinely really liked this. Totally. As a piece of entertainment. So I, I'm a bit more positive on the episode just because I'm so tickled with how they use Neil Gaiman. I think that it was really cool and from the ways that you mentioned mm-hmm. and the uh, j- just in the ways that he seemed to be so game to be part of this episode. Yeah. Now, the the whole structure around it is very simplistic, and it's and it it seems to be like, hey, we got Neil Gaiman for you, just like, oh, well, then we'll write a really nice episode about him about how making graphic novels is good. Actually, I I think I, w- I actually would have really loved it if they would have snuck Sandman in there somewhere. Yeah, but it's like uh, Sandman's a little maybe uh, wait wait until high school for that one, kids. Yeah, but but it's like the Coraline graphic novel, cool, like great. That's a great way to great way to start. Great story. Um. So I think it was just really um, novel. Oh. Ah, cool. <laughs> I didn't even mean. <laughs> yeah, very, very novel in the ways that they used their guest star and the ways that they um, imagined Sue Ellen's story. You're right; it is it is all a little convenient the way that it the way that it happened. But I, I found myself um, having moments of delight, and even in the uh, weird, broad Greek stereotype character, it's like. We, like literally this is the first time we've seen him and according to the Arthur wiki we never see him again so it's like it's like it's like maybe that was a Neil Gaiman's writer of like falafel Must. truck <laughs> manager like that in the green M&Ms in the, in the green room or whatever right right <laughs> I don't know so and the, I mean especially you compare it to the great lint rush which I I I don't like, but I almost respect in the sense of just like, this is one of the weirdest episodes of Arthur, (laughs) like straight up. I know that Arthur itself, so many episodes have their strange moments and we've talked about them time and time again. We reference all of the strange moments. We had an email in the past episode about all of the weird moments of Arthur, but this one is just like from, it's like 11 minutes and I'm like, I'm frequently just, like I said before, looking around at an invisible audience, I'm watching this. I'm just like, is anybody else seeing this? Yeah. What's happening? I know. Am I still here? Like, have I ascended or something? <laughs> like, am I transcending time and space where the dog's talking to a frog and the frog's got a squirrel and the, and the squirrel's fanning the frog? And like, oh, my God. It's just the most off-the-wall elements of Arthur coming together. And they frequently do in these. And I think that there is definitely a type of viewer that really enjoys these episodes because of how offbeat and unusual it is and the type of humor it employs. I'm not really one of them. I generally don't care for the Kate and Pal episodes, but this one is at least memorable. I, the last time we had one of these, it was really like, uh, like thumb in the middle to thumb down. And just like, that's kind of boring. This is not boring. Right. Like 
it's the it's it's like the Futurama quote. This is horrible, but it's not boring. <laughs> so I was just I, I'm I'm almost knocked over by this episode. So yeah, did not care for it, but I kind of respect it. <laughs> what about, what about you, Jason? I th- I th- yeah, I think we're on the same we're at the same place with this episode uh, as a whole. Uh, you know, uh, it's not. Again, like I think this isn't this isn't my favorite ep- Arthur episode, but that doesn't mean it's bad. Uh, mm-hmm. It just I it didn't really it wasn't my favorite Arthur episode. Like I have nothing more to say about it than that, I guess. But like right. it was fun to see. I like I always love an excuse to hang out with you, so I didn't. I like loved watching it for that reason. Fair enough. Yeah, we there's there's a, there's certainly no shortage of things to talk about. I would have been really disappointed if. We had we had done this, and it's like two boring stories, and it's like these are not boring. No, and, yeah, not at all. And so far, season fourteen is really delivering. If not for good episodes, and at least for memorable ones, yeah, creativity in one way or the other, right? So that brings us to the end of an episode of Elwood City Limits. Jason, it was so good to have you on here, and for everyone to hear uh, on the free feed on ECL Prime. So. Um, in case anybody doesn't know, where can people find you? And are you, uh, I mean, people may be wondering now, Find DW, great podcast. And getting to the end of the Find DW podcast, people may be like, well, what's he going to do next? Of course, I've told you before, people are like, well, when's Finding Arthur? And I'm like, hold, hold on there. Hold on. So, I mean, I, I, you have a web presence that I think people would surely love to follow you. But, uh, yeah, aside from that, any other future endeavors that you're embarking on well, at this point? I mean, I'm aware of the I'm aware of the desire for um, a finding Arthur. Um, it's very humbling that people want that and I and, and want that from me. I think yes. it's just um, I get it. I think it would be a cool podcast, too, or a cool piece of content, too. Uh, it's yeah. it's just not where I want to put my my time and energy right now. Um, I I'm working on stuff. Uh, I'll never stop writing and and making stuff. But as I was telling you, uh, you know, before the episode started for real, like when we were, um, I think for, like I'm I'm focusing on taking the skills I learned, you know, over the last like two years, and and especially while making Finding DW. And seeing if I can use that towards building a career, a more sustainable career. Um, mm-hmm. In that in that process, I hope to make more projects that are like not so career centric. And what I mean by that is something like Finding DW, where it's it's more um, like uh, in the pursuit of of making like like a creative expression, where I it's not about making money, right? Like, yes. Um, I am working on stuff like that too. It's just my my priority right now is how can I build a sustainable career where I'm using like where I'm flexing the the writing and the podcast muscles um, mm-hmm. in order to make my living. Like that's just as I'm trying to be as transparent as I can be. So that's that's not it's not the most exciting because there's nothing really to see. I mean, I'm working for a podcast right now um, called um, the um, what's it called. Um, I, I lost my train of thought for a second. I'm so sorry. Um, it's called so it's a it's a podcast called the um, the Inner Circle Podcast, um, and it's for a company called Impact Zero, which is a, a nonprofit based in Toronto. Um, and their whole deal is they they want to teach as many people as possible about the circular economy and um, oh. in, implementing sustainable business practices into their workflow, into their consumption habits. Um, so I'm I'm producing on that show, which is very exciting for their season three. Um, I'm also trying to I'm I'm working on a, po- a project right now that's you know we'll see like I'm making a pilot for potentially another podcast. Um, so putting my efforts into making podcasts for others is one way that I'm making stuff that maybe you can engage with if you're interested, uh, but it's not Arthur centric. Um, but yeah, to follow me like please follow me on Instagram. It's very helpful to have people there because then when I do make something that's more me centric, there will be be people there listening. So please feel free to follow me on there. It's just my name, Jason Schwimmer. Um, Twitter too, same deal. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, that's it, I guess. Well, I've got a, I've got a, 
free pitch for you for Late uh, on season me. three. The sock market. The now, sock there market. Is it, the, there is an alternative means to the to the uh, economies that we have today. Is <laughs> and try and sneak lint in there too. Right. That's that. That's a freebie for you. Thank, I mean, I appreciate it a lot. You know, that'll really help. That'll really help. <laughs> I think so. I think I think so. Uh, yeah. So like maybe give me like twenty five percent kickback on the uh, on the obvious gr- on the green you're making. Yeah. Yeah. The check's already in the mail. Boom. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Jason, I think I speak for a lot, if not all, of our audience when we say that we're very excited that you're going to can be continuing in podcasting in one realm or another. I think that you've already proven that you have the skills to really be a benefit to whoever would have you as part of their team or if you decided to strike out on your own. So we're excited to see what's happening, and we always enjoy checking in with you since our first time talking to you last year and then into this year. Um, yeah, we're just always we're just always wondering what your next move is going to be and how we can help you as much as you have helped us by giving us a peek behind the curtain of Arthur and just hanging out. You're just a, you're just a good voice to have in our our roster here. I mean, Will, like it's always thank you for the kind words and you know I'm it's humbling to have anyone interested in talking to me for any reason. I love being on podcasts. I love podcasts in general. Uh, so it's it's a blast, and uh, and thank you, and thank you to the to the audience too. Everyone, please continue to support this great great show. I apologize if I was a terrible guest, and oh, if I said anything to offend anyone, I apologize. <laughs> but I had a lot of fun, Will, and and I uh, I, I hope you'll continue to think of me uh, when you need a guest on this show. Oh, you bet. I still have to. I, I still have to contain myself i still get a little starstruck of like i can ask jason to be on the podcast oh god oh my god he said yes don't ah. don't be starstruck um yeah oh, it's please hard, no it's if anything it's mutual like please don't i'm just a guy i'm just a guy mm. on the internet you know doing my thing it just happened Somebody to have s- had this this thing that happened to me in the past where i happened to have been the voice of dw you know <laughs> So somebody got starstruck by me on instagram recently yeah I, I, think, I think i felt the way that you feel i'm like but it's just me right like it's it's just me i'm just a guy it's so, weird right one of these days i'll get over it and maybe it'll be the next time that we speak but i'll i'll keep it to myself either way real quick everybody that's the end of elwood city limits patreon.com slash elwood city limits now we're gonna have to stagger the release of our next for the kids a pbs kids podcast but if you're a patron you can vote in our current poll because we need help deciding what the next episode is going to be is it going to be adventures from the book of virtues or super why if you want to cast your vote as a patron go to patreon.com slash elwood city limits and click on the poll if you would like to cast your vote but you're not a patron feel free to join us that episode will be coming out a little bit later than usual but we have some cool stuff coming to the patreon very very soon that is aside from for the kids of pbs kids podcast what could it be well if you're a patron check out the update if you're not become a patron and check out the update. But we appreciate you listening, whether you're a patron or whether you are not. Coming up next time on Elwood City Limits, I'm going to have another special guest that I'm keeping a little bit close to the vest who has never been on an episode of Elwood City Limits, at least not yet. And we're going to be talking about tales of grotesquely grim bunny and pet projects as we go through the, I mean, I'll say very, uh, to me at least, very positive season 14 let's hope that they can keep the streak up as we make our way through my name's will young thank you so much for joining us and for jason schwimmer thanks we'll see you next time (laughs) (laughs) that was great it sounded like you were halfway across the room (laughs) i didn't know what you wanted me to say i was i was put on the spot i was just so you know it was like a moment where you're like i was just like listening to the podcast and then like forgot i was on it i'm like oh shit it's my turn to talk